Independent Researcher 6H. Ossuaries The Galilee and Early Judeo-Christians. Ancient DNA its damage and the few Natufian fossils to base a model on, wouldn't be the best scientific approach to take. One must keep in mind they have not found every single ancient fossil in Israel and from what they have found very little information has been made public. Why? Due to the heightened sensitivity of what the evidence represents. No haplogroups from the first century have been revealed for any of the IAA Israel Antiquities Authority finds. Only older phases of the ancient land of Israel have been made public. Out of 90 sites widely believed to be Natufian, only 5 Y-DNA samples have been published. To believe that these 5 samples could represent the complete makeup of the entire population is heavily flawed for a number of reasons. Two of the samples are haplogroup CTP9.1, and the remaining three samples are haplogroup E, 1XP2 plus 2XZ827. The Natufians were the first society to adopt a sedentary lifestyle in Israel are they possibly Semitic? We must look at Abram from Ur of the Chaldees which is believed to be in Iraq or southeast Turkey. Abraham has been compared to Idrimi of Alalak who lived in Syria his autobiographical inscription is the only one of a kind archaeologically from the Middle Bronze Age Syro-Palestine ever found. The inscription of Idrimi and the Book of Abraham share many parallels and motifs. Next looking at the Afro-Asiatic languages that is spoken in the Middle East and North Africa. The AAL tree is commonly divided into six branches, Semitic, Omotic, Berber, Cushitic, and Chadic. Ancient Egyptian was also a member of this family now extinct five out of six or so called Hamitic with one Semitic and an absence of a Japhetite tongue. The Proto-Semitic language likely spoken in the 4th millennium BC, and the oldest attested forms of Semitic date to the mid-3rd millennium BC, the early Bronze Age 3-4 Kya. Speakers of East Semitic include the people of the Akkadian Empire, Assyria and Babylonia. Looking back at that Natufian layer the tools, the Stone Age roundhouse, circle hut structures, the consumption of pig and snake, and finally their flower burial customs for example the research paper titled A 12,000 year old shaman burial from the southern Levant, Israel, Grossmana, Munrock and Belfer Cohen the Natufians of the southern Levant, 15,000-11,500 calories BP, underwent pronounced socioeconomic changes associated with the onset of sedentism and the shift from a foraging to farming lifestyle. Excavations at the Natufian site of Hilazon Toktit in the western Galilee region have revealed a unique burial of an elderly woman. The grave portrays several attributes that later become central in the spiritual arena of human cultures worldwide the grave goods comprised 50 complete tortoise shells and select body parts of a wild boar, an eagle, a cow, a leopard, and two martens, as well as a complete human foot. The interment rituals and the method used to construct and seal the grave suggest that this is the burial of a shaman, one of the earliest known from the archaeological record. It is in contrast to the Jewish perception of keeping the burial as simple as possible without any so-called grave goods. The Semitic culture square houses would have been introduced from around the Persian Gulf region clearly taking in account the ziggurat proving the Natufian culture did not originate the Semitic style of square house structures. Haplogroup T had a strong connection to the Fertile Crescent. This area has the highest frequency and diversity of TM70 added with the fact that this region has the oldest ancient DNA T, Adna, found today. A single sample was found in the Jordan Valley dated to around 10 Kya. In the Upper Galilee the finds in the Pekian Cave are the highest frequency of T samples found at any one site anywhere at that period or any time prior. Over 300 ossuary bone boxes were discovered at these Pekian site. The secondary burial practice wasn't a common ritual. It was believed only to have been practiced during the first century exclusively in Jerusalem and its surrounding areas by Jews and early Judeo-Christians. It is unknown when or why it started but we know when it ceased to exist after 70 AD. It is considered a typical Jewish burial. It is very important to understand that it is believed to have only been practiced during the first century. There is one source that validates the custom, it's never mentioned in the Talmud so it's possible the custom began after the Babylonian captivity but it is mentioned as Christ's burial because tombs are ossuaries. 
We don't need fancy dating to figure out the custom of ossuary burial because it is only placed around the time of the first century and was not a widespread practice. Back then as now real estate was expensive. Like in Egypt only royals were mummified so only people of importance who believed in physical reassertion. So location was of importance for the religious, wealthy elite or politically powerful. The poor were buried in the soft earth far outside of the city walls. I must stress only the religious would do this custom and only people of status would have the means to do so. This would have only been common among Jews and moreover so by Christ family and followers so when finding ossuaries in Jerusalem we cannot forget this important fact that Joseph of Arimathea was a wealthy Jewish man who buried the body in what was his own grand family tomb. No one has to fake an ossuary one can easily acquire one at an antique shop in Israel for $500 to $2,000 depending on if it is plain or ornamental. Six ossuaries with Six ossuaries with the name Jesus have been found and only two have been found with Jesus son of Joseph. We never know for 100% certainty with archaeology and when comparing it with biblical accounts together they many times can be contradictory to each other. The Galilee had a plethora of ancient cultures. Christ was selective with where he chose to spread his message and perform his miracles in towns where he and his own people resided. For example the city of Sepphoris also aka. The Mosaic City, home to some of the most elaborate mosaics in Israel or in Sepphoris with buildings depicting ways of a Roman the most impressive is the Nile mosaic showing Egyptian festivities when the Nile River peaked according to the Nilometer. A pillar with the number 17 on it shows the flood's height complete with crocodiles and other exotic animals also Pharos Lighthouse in Alexandria, one of the seven wonders of the world. The Mona Lisa Mosaic in the Dionysus house, named for the Greek god of wine and revelry, why some say Christ turned water to wine which was a common charlatan trick to gather people to one. In that day and time the indigenous people of the Galilee were being subjugated to Rome. The vibrant city of Sepphoris is not mentioned in the Bible this city would have been within an hour's walk to the small village of Nazareth. Jesus seems to have avoided the big cities that were heavily populated and ran by the Romans. The transformation of water into wine at the wedding at Cana is considered the first miracle attributed to Jesus in the Gospel of John. Cana was simply where Christ chose to perform a miracle in public. Matthew the first book of the New Testament is often not mentioned but is before the book of John so these are the very first miracles performed. Matthew 4 23-25 KJV 23 and Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, and preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing all manner of sickness and all manner of disease among the people. 24 And his fame went throughout all Syria, and they brought unto him all sick people that were taken with diverse diseases and torments, and those which were possessed with devils, and those which were lunatic, and those that had the palsy, and he healed them. 25 And there followed him great multitudes of people from Galilee, and from Decapolis, and from Jerusalem, and from Judea, and from beyond Jordan. Jesus of Nazareth said I have came for the lost sheep of the house of Israel saying to the woman, a Canaanite, she is like a dog. If people were coming from the northeast direction and from as far as Syria that would mean Jews remained in Syria. Roman elite and aristocrats would have began to occupy the Galilee due to its abundant supply of fresh water that feeds into the Jordan River and ends up in the Dead Sea. This would have led to a land grab by the Romans and more taxes on the Jewish peasant class of the Galilee who would have had to give up their ownership of their long-held homesteads that would have been in their families for generations. Christ's first 30 years of life are unknown only his last three years of life are recorded. He would have had an apprenticeship under his father Joseph the carpenter but most likely a stone mason because the Semitic style home was primarily made of stone. Christ and some of the Semites from Syria would have all been of the same culture. Syria in that day would have occupied the Mediterranean coast nearly from Caesarea to well beyond Sidon. This Semitic culture would have eventually made its way to Jerusalem introducing the ossuary burial practice. People such as Mary of Magdala and her brother Philip all the early apostles would have been from the Galilee or followers from the multitudes of people from Decapolis, Jerusalem, Judea, and from beyond Jordan. This movement would have spread south into Judea bringing their Galilean customs. 
The Peckian cave ossuaries and Petrus bones proves this was done prior to what is believed to have been only practiced during the first century in and around Judea and nowhere else. The synagogue would have harem, Hebrew. Also Romanized cherem, harem, is the highest ecclesiastical censure in the Jewish community. It is the total exclusion of a person from the Jewish community. It is a form of shunning and is similar to vitandus, excommunication, in the Catholic Church. The original Judeo Christian movement would have been lost and replaced within the synagogue, and the same within what would have become the Gentile Roman Church and Catholicism as we know it today, which differs in many ways from the original Jewish culture. Due to the belief in Christ Yeshua as Messiah, a rabbi, they all being followers of Christ would have been kicked out of the synagogue, removed from their roles in leadership. Meanwhile, the Romans feed the Judeo Christ followers to lions and ultimately they take parts of the teachings and add their Roman paganism to it. It is not hard to say the DNA of these people would be fairly rare among both groups today. Haplogroup T is rare and scarcely scattered but widespread at very low frequencies. Its frequency gets much higher among Jews, natives to the Near East and the Horn of Africa. Other haplogroups found amongst Jews and other peoples of the Near East have extremely high frequencies of non-Middle Eastern and non-Semitic people with those similar subclades unlike T which is completely opposite from the other haplogroups patterns of diversity and likely origins. Using the fossils as an argument, Telephone Abel Beth Maka is one site where they uncovered a Y haplogroup T sample which is pretty far down along the T tree way past TP77 actually TCTS 6280. This compounded with the fact that older finds in earlier SNES have been found to suggest a continuity, finding the most diversity of TM184, M70 in the Fertile Crescent. With a wide time range that dates to the Bronze Age and even later Iron Age 1011 846 BCE to earlier Copper Age up into the MPPNB Middle Pre-Pottery Neolithic B being present. It is unscientific to view the lack of older fossils to believe it wasn't likely already in the area prior and still maintained until even present day.